and greetings from Berkeley, California, everyone. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for this exciting talk on royal capitalism by Ajahn Puangchon Unjanam with a response from Professor Andrew Johnson. My name is Titi Jamkajon Kiat, a PhD candidate in South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley and the academic chair of the US-based Association for Thai Democracy or ATD. I wish to thank the Center for Southeast Asia Studies for agreeing to host this event out of solidarity. If you're interested in the ATD's cost and projects, please consider visiting our website and following our social media accounts, which I will be posting in chat, chat box later. Today, in the American time zones, is October 6th. In Thailand, today, 45 years ago, the ultra royalist polices paramilitaries and mobs murder up to 41 student protesters sheltering inside Thammasat University. It is now officially known as the Thammasat University or October 6, 1976 massacre in the English speaking world. The Thai elites have been actively erasing the memories of this massacre. Therefore, before introducing the speaker, I wish to ask all of us to commemorate these students who dream for the better future of Thailand in silence for 30 seconds. This is in the spirit of remembering those brave souls and resisting the Thai state's act of force forgetting. Without further ado, allow me to now introduce our speaker, Ajahn Puangchon Unjanam. Ajahn Puangchon received his PhD in political science from the City University of New York, where he worked with Corey Robin, Susan Buckmorse, and Vincent Boudreau. He currently teaches political theory, political economy, and modern Thai politics at Narea Suan University in Pisanulo Province, Thailand. Besides Marxist theory and social inequality and class conflict in Thailand, he also has interest in the question of animal liberation from a Marxist perspective. He is the author of Royal Capitalism, Wealth, Class and Monarchy in Thailand, on which the talk this evening is based. This talk is structured as the following. Ajahn Puangchon will give a lecture for 45 minutes, followed by Professor Johnson's response. Then we open the floor up for Q&A until the event ends. During and after the talk, feel free to post your questions or comments in the separate Q&A box. Please also specify your current affiliation in your post. Ajahn Puangchon, now the screen is yours. Thanks, Titi, very much for an introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Center for Southeast Asia Studies and the Association for Thai Democracy to sponsor this event. It is an honor for me to be here today. And I would like to thank everyone who attend this event. Now, please let me share with you the screen of my computer. My presentation today is based on some puzzles, questions, and ideas that I present in this book, Royal Capitalism, Wealth, Class, and Monarchy in Thailand. Due to a time limit I have today, I cannot say everything about this book, but I hope that the case study and some puzzles that I show you today will invite you to read the book by yourself. Now, let me begin the presentation. My presentation today will be divided into three sections. First, I would like to talk about general perception when we think about the relation between capital and monarchy. I also want to talk 
about some stereotypes. When people think about Thailand, second, I would like to propose that there is a better way to understand the relation between capital and monarchy. Last, I would like to show a case study of Thailand. I believe that we can learn many things from how capital and the crown are related to one another in this country. So let me start with the common perception when we think about capital and monarchy. We tend to believe that monarchy belongs to the past. It is a feudal, backward, and outdated institution. It cannot survive in the age of capitalism. Thanks to the history of the so-called bourgeois revolution in the 17th to the 18th century, especially in the United Kingdom, France, and the US, we tend to believe that the capitalist class is by nature a revolutionary or even anti-royalist class. So when the capitalists are rising, the crowd must be falling down. Monarchy as the pinnacle of feudalism and absolutism seems to have no place in a state once capitalism prevails. I also want to mention about some stereotypes when we think about Thailand. For many people, the Thai monarchy is not an important actor in the kingdom because it is just a constitutional and ceremonial institution. In contrast, the important actors in Thai politics are the army, politicians, and bureaucrats. The and the crucial actors in the Thai economy are Sino-Thai billionaires. Most important for many people, Thailand is just a developing country in the so-called third world. And its economy is still based on agriculture and tourism. So capitalism or class conflict between the capitalists and the working class seems to be unrelated to Thailand. In other words, capitalism has nothing to do with Thailand. On top of that, many people believe that the reason why the Thai monarchy still exists today is that this institution has its religious roots in Buddhism, which is the main religion of the Thai population. This institution benefits from its historical longevity, continuity, and stability. And the crown also benefits from local culture in Thai society, which seem to be unique and different from other cultures and societies. In other words, some people believe that it is very really normal or even natural for Thai people to respect and worship the monarchy because this is part of the so-called Thainess or Kwam Pen Thai in Thai language. In this presentation, I want to challenge those perceptions and propose a better way to understand capital, monarchy, and Thailand. Let's start with the relation between capital and the crown. If we look at monarchies that still exist today, we may find that 
Monarchy not only survived, but thrives despite the global domination of capitalism. Monarchy can adapt itself very well to capitalism and the relationship between monarchy and the bourgeoisie may not be antagonistic as we believe. In fact, it can be symbiotic. The crown and capital can coexist with one another. And if we take a look at Thailand very closely, we should find that the monarchy has played more than a ceremonial role in Thai politics. In fact, the crown is not afraid to make a political intervention when royal wealth and power are on the line. Moreover, in the last few decades, the Thai economy has developed rapidly and now it is undeniable that Thailand is a newly industrialized, a newly capitalist country. It is driven by the bourgeoisie and it has class conflict in society. Most important, if we take a look at the Thai market, it is undeniable that Sino Thai billionaires are not the only major players in town. In fact, the crown is one of the biggest investors in the market. On top of that, I believe that if we want to understand why the Thai monarchy still exists today, and remain one of the most important institutions of the capitalist kingdom, we should pay attention to how the crowd transformed itself over a period of time, how it broke with the feudal past, how it rebranded itself, and how it reinvented itself by embracing bourgeois ethic and culture, which are the ideologies that come with capitalism. In this regard, instead of treating Thailand as an isolated case, we can study Thailand as a case among many countries, many kingdoms that are developed under the power of capitalism. So Thailand will be less exotic, unique, and oriental for, uh, in our eyes. Instead, we can look at this country with a critical view and comparative approach. Now, I would like to shift gears and discuss in detail about the relation between capital and the crown in Thailand. There are four topics in this section. Namely, I want to show how the crown has played a crucial role in the market, the state, pop culture, and class relations. So let's start with the market. The Thai monarchy is the richest monarchy on earth. And the Thai king is the world's wealthiest royal. It has been estimated that the wealth of the Thai crown is approximately 40 to 70 billion dollars. This massive wealth makes King Wajiralongkorn, the reigning monarch of Thailand, 
richer than the oil rich monarchs such as the Sultan of Brunei and the king and royalty from the Arab countries. There is no need to say that the Thai king is richer than those monarchs in the post-industrialized and advanced capitalist kingdoms, such as the United Kingdom, Japan, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Now, some people may wonder where the royal wealth come from. My answer is it comes from several sources. The major source of royal wealth come from the Crown Property Bureau or the CPB. This is an institution that manages the wealth of the Thai monarchy. The CPB itself invests royal capital in three types of business. First, it owns the Siam Cement Group, which is the biggest industrial conglomerate in Southeast Asia. Second, it owns the Siam Commercial Bank, which is the which is one of the biggest banks in Southeast Asia. Last, it owns land, especially prime estates in Bangkok. A good example of this kind of estate is the land that is the location of Central World, one of the biggest shopping mall in the world today. The CPB has a problematic status in the market and in the state. It was originally created by the monarchy in the mid 19th century as the, as the institution that managed the income and expense of the king and the royal family. It was also created for the king to personally invest royal capital in the market. However, in the early 20th century, the CPB was transformed into a state agency. And the CPB's wealth was aimed to be used for the benefits of the nation, not the crown. But in the mid 20th century, the ownership of the CPB had changed again. It came back to the crown and its wealth was aimed to be used for the royal benefits. Recently, under the current reign of King Wajiralongkorn, the CPB's wealth has been transferred to the personal ownership of the king. So now it seems like there is no longer debate about the ownership of the CPB. Legally, it belongs to the king only and he can do anything with it at, as he please. In addition to the CPB, there are other sources that fund the monarchy. The government provides big budget to the crown every year. At first, the budget was aimed to sponsor the royal household and royal ceremonies. However, since the late 20th century, the biggest portion of the budget has been used to fund the so-called royal projects, which are some kind of philanthropic foundations of the royal family. Moreover, 
under the current reign. The budget is used to fund the king's personal security guard and the king's personal service bureau. In 1990, the budget that funded the monarchy was around $20 million. Last year, the budget was sky high raised to $1.1 billion. In addition to the government, the private sector is also eager to sponsor the crown. The owners of biggest corporations in Thailand, especially those sino Thai billionaires, donate money and goods to the king and members of the royal family every single year. There is no accountability of this donation. When the capitalists donate money to the crowd, they insist that the king can use that money as he pleads. These activities of donating money to the crowd is a crucial way to create a partnership and connection between the king and the capitalist class. Once this partnership is created, <coughs> the king usually grants royal decoration to capitalists, whereas the capitalists appointed the king's close associates as the board of directors of their companies. This is the way they return the favor to the crowd. There are many corporations, both in Thailand and from abroad, that have a close relation with the monarchy. And these are household names. When we think about capitalism in Thailand and beyond. For example, the palace welcomed donations from biggest corporations in Thailand, such as the CP Group, Thai Beverage, the Central Group, Bangkok Bank, King Power, Bunrod Brewery, and Shin Corporation. The palace also welcomed donations from multinational corporations such as Philips, Toyota, Nestle, and Astra Seneca. Recently, the partnership between the Crown and the last company, Astra Seneca has become very controversial because the king's private company named Siam Bioscience was granted the right to produce AstraZeneca anti-COVID-19 anti vaccines in Southeast Asia. And the Thai government decided to buy and use AstraZeneca vaccines as the main vaccines for the Thai population. So for many people, there are conflict of interest in this multi-dollar deal between the Thai government, Astra Senegal, and the King's Pharmaceutical Company. The last type of royal wealth come from private investment of members of the royal family. They usually own prime estate and lease it to shopping mall and luxury hotel owners. They also invest capital in stock market. A good example is Princess Sirinton. She is one of the king's sisters. 
She owns land in the business district of Bangkok, and she invests capital in several companies. Some royalty even become capitalist entrepreneurs. For example, Princess Siliwan Wali. She is one of the king's daughters. She created her own fashion brand, and she sees herself as a fashion icon and entrepreneur. If the relationship between the crowd and capital is my buckling, the relationship between the crowd and the state is also stunning. In the 1930s, the absolute monarchy in Thailand was overthrown, and the crowd itself was almost abolished. In contrast, today, the crown is certainly one of the most powerful institutions in the kingdom. The jury, the Thai monarchy is restrained by the national constitution, but de facto, the king, the royal family, and the privy council frequently intervene into national politics to protect royal wealth and power. On top of that, the crown has maintained a long and close alliance with the military. So when military coups happened, the junta leaders normally claim that they did it first and foremost to protect, to protect the throne from any political threat. Similarly, instead of challenging the crown, the Thai parliament usually follows the royal leadership. Politicians in the parliament give special privilege to the CPB and protect it as the king's company. They also follow the king's speech or his personal demands. Moreover, Thai bureaucrats are anything but anti-royalists. They do not serve the people, but the king. And they proudly call themselves the king's servants. In contrast to a general perception that the Thai monarchy is sacred, God-like, divine, and untouchable, the crowd today has embedded itself in pop culture as the, and it has presented itself as the embodiment of the bourgeois ethic of hard work, frugality, and self-reliance. The so-called sufficiency economy philosophy is the economic vision of King Pumipon. He was the father of King Wajilalongon. This pseudo-economic idea about a retreat from capitalism and a return to a village economy and a sufficiency economy has been widely promoted by the government and the palace. It even has been incorporated into the national development plan. Moreover, Thai royalty do not shy away from bourgeois activities that are related to sport, art, technology, and science. In Thai pop culture, there are famous legends of King Pumipon that have been propagated 
by the mass media and the palace. According to the legend, the king lived a frugal life. He used every drop of toothpaste until the toothpaste tube was totally flat. He used his shoes until their soles were very thin. And he used his pencils until the graphite was completely gone. The king was also a hardworking man who never stopped working. He was a down-to-earth king and a beloved father of the nation. These legends are clearly contradict contradictory to the fact that he was the wealthiest monarch on earth and members of the royal family all live in a luxury life. For some people who travel to Thailand for the first time, they might be surprised to see that, to see the image of the images of the king and the royal family almost everywhere they go. On television, big corporations usually use royal images to sell their products. In shopping malls, there are events that salute the greatness of the king. In civil society, there are royal activities that are aimed to solve drug, poverty, environment, and education problems. So it might not be an overstatement to say that in Thailand, there is the picture every home has. It is the picture of the king. <clears throat> In addition to the market, the state and culture, the Thai crowd is also uh, closely related to social class and class conflict in Thai society. Over a period of time, there is a radical change of mass-based supporters of the crowd. In the last century, the main supporters of the monarchy came from the rural, poor, agricultural, laboring, and less educated people. But when Thailand had transformed into a newly capitalist country at the turn of the century, the main supporters of the crown became the urban middle class, well-educated and wealthy section of the population. In the 21st century, as the gap between the rich and the poor in Thailand has become bigger and bigger, the monarchy became the symbol of conservative force such as the infamous yellow shirt movement. The monarchy and the conservative, they want to keep intact the status, the status of the rich while suppressing demands from the poor, especially those who are called the red shirts. Moreover, the conservatives and the monarchy support neoliberalist policies and they are against social welfare. For them, 
the only type of welfare that the Thai people should have is the welfare that is provided by the monarchy through royal projects and royal philanthropic activities. So if we want to understand what is going on in Thailand today, why there are many people protest on the streets, why the protesters demand a reform of monarchy, why the protesters are so angry and frustrated about the king. We have to understand that Thailand has been plagued by social conflict and the monarchy is a big part of many problems that create that conflict. Those problems include social inequality, the lack of social welfare, the undemocratic government, the extra constitutional power of the crown, the privilege of the royal companies in the market, the concentration of wealth among the monarchy and the elite capitalists, the massive wealth of the king. While ordinary people still struggling to make ends meet. So many people, especially those who belong to the new generation, have had enough with, the, with those conditions in Thai society. They protest the monarch, his luxury life, his concentration of power and wealth, his ill treatment of women and close associates, and his neglect of the people's demands. In addition to a call for monarchy to be restrained under the constitution, the protesters also call for the accountability of royal wealth. They do not want to give a free pass to the royal accumulation of capital in the market. They want the Crown Property Bureau to be transferred back into the control of the government. And they ask for the welfare state instead of the state that the only type of welfare is the form of royal philanthropy. I want to talk a little bit about something beyond Thailand. Even though the majority of the nation states today are republic, it does not mean that monarchy as a form of government will become extinct very soon. In the most advanced capitalist countries, most progressive welfare states and most stable democratic countries, such as the United Kingdom, Japan, the lower countries, and the Scandinavian countries. Monarchy is still the form of government that they use. Even though monarchies in those countries are no longer relevant to politics and the economy, they are still a big part of pop culture and state ideology. In the Middle East, monarchies welcome foreign investments 
from multinational corporations. Monarchies have a great and long relationship with powerful and wealthy republic, such as the United States. Some Arab royalty even become global capitalists. A good example is Sheikh Mansour. He is a member of the royal family of Abu Dhabi, and he is the owner of Manchester City FC, one of the biggest and richest soccer clubs in the world today. And if we look at the elite members of the capitalist class today, we should find that there are some similarities between monarchs and business moguls, namely the capitalist magnets always want to create their own business dynasty and empire. And they want to give their wealth to their own offsprings. Moreover, in the global market, we can find that giant corporations accumulate wealth through monopoly rent and privileges instead of a free competition. So in the age of capitalism, there are some characteristics of the capitalists that look similar to the main features of the feudal era, which was the time when kings and queens still rule the world. Now, I would like to conclude my presentation. <clears throat> As I have shown in this presentation, Thailand is a very interesting case. It reveals that monarchy is strongly congealed and embedded in capitalism. The crown remains the kingdom's dominant institution and the world's wealthiest monarchy. And royalty still live long and large in cooperation with the bourgeoisie's interests and ideology. I think the Thai case invite all of us to rethink and discuss some questions that seem to be neglected when we think about capitalism today. What is the role of monarchy in capitalist society? How the crowd accumulate capital in the market? Is a capitalist kingdom different from a capitalist republic? Is class struggle in a capitalist kingdom different from class struggle in a capitalist republic? Will monarchy survive in the age of global capitalism? These are questions that inspire me to write this book. And I hope that they will inspire you to study and question the relationship between capital, the crown, and social class as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn Puang Chon.
for your extremely thoughtful discussion of royal capitalism in Thailand. Let me quickly introduce Professor Andrew Johnson, our discussant. Professor Johnson is a visiting scholar at the Center for Southeast Asia Studies at Berkeley. Professor Johnson is an anthropologist by training whose intellectual interests cover wide ranging phenomena as expected of a rising anthropologist of Southeast Asia from ghosts to Asian financial crisis, urbanism, migrant workers and hydropower dams on the Mekong River. Professor Johnson, please proceed with your responses. Thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you, Adan Phuong uh, for this uh, absolutely enlightening talk. I'm going to read out some comments that I have right now and as well as field the questions from the audience. So, um, but first I think, I think most of our audience is familiar with the situation in, in Thailand and has been following Thai politics. But for those who aren't, I'd like to underline how unique a moment this particular time is for Thai studies of the monarchy. Um, the hegemony of the past reign of Rama the Ninth was so strong that it made it very hard to openly discuss the kinds of things that are being discussed right now. So right now is a, a time, it's a time of uh, potential, it's a time of potential risk. And so scholars like Ajahn uh, Huang Chuan who write about this is, are extremely brave as well as cutting edge in, in thinking about these issues. And I think, um, especially the relationship between monarchy, capitalism, and media is extremely important to look at right now with the, via the example of Thailand. I think it's we're all oftentimes told how the Thai monarchy is timeless, um, something that has been around for, you know, uh, since at least the founding of Bangkok and possibly since the time of King uh, Ram Kham Hang. But I think it's also important to see how it has changed over the years. Too. You've got multiple different modes of, of being from uh, the feudal Saktina system to the absolutism of Rama V to the well-heeled socialite moments of the mid-Cold War where the Thai monarchy may have looked similar. And, and one question I'd like to ask Ajana Buangchon is, can one draw uh, parallels between 1950s, 1960s Thai monarchy and the Shah of Iran or other kinds of places that were within the American sphere of power um, with a kind of a established monarchy. Um, to, and I think that at the most, most uh, interesting point is this height of mass media hypercapitalism in the late 90s, where the rule of Rama the Ninth really hit its absolute maximum. So that's what I kind of want to focus in, in my comments and questions on here is that that particular moment. And I want to think of a little bit about the relationship between entrepreneurship and capitalism and monarchy and the role in branding. And I think the idea of what I'd like to ask about is the idea of vagueness in entrepreneurship, future oriented thought, hope in a sense. Think about how um, people talk about the monarchy, especially in that time period of the 1990s, where each member of the royal family had a kind of a, um, perfection and a certain role. It was almost like watching the Avengers. You had the scientist, you had the scholar, you had the soldier, you had the fashion icon, you had the medical uh, uh, princess, and, and of course you had the father ab above all. And I think what, I, I don't mean to be funny in bringing up pop culture, because I think oftentimes when we talk about the Thai monarchy, there's a, ch a, a chance to go back. Oftentimes we go back to the Zataka, we go back to Chakavati, we go back to these Buddhist concepts of kingship, which are there, but are also, I, I wanna draw on what uh, anthropologist Susan Lepselter talks about uh, as resonance. The idea that we kind of gravitate towards stories that sound similar, even if they're not always in the same register. So the idea of, 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 of superheroes, of sort of iconic types, embedding itself within the monarchy was a, a absolute, um, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, I, I want to use the word coup in a metaphorical sense, but it maybe is not the right word to use in, in this context of Thailand. But it, it's a, it, it, it was a staying, had a great deal of hegemonic staying power. Um, so each member of the royal family and especially the king gets this characteristic as being the sort of best of people. 
the best of kind of person, a person with no flaws, an ideal type, at least no flaws that one can legally speak of. Um, however, in this perfection, they become unreal. The idea that you would use a pencil down to its nub makes the story itself unbelievable. At the same time, it's extremely relatable. So they become, in a way, metaphorical. There's a certain vagueness in the idea that of, of the monarch and that you can't really imagine what he's doing at any point in time. Um, so the, the narratives that, again, narratives that have resonance don't have to be the Vesantara Jataka. They don't have to be these Buddhist ideas of kingship. They can be quite prosaic stories about, oh, well, your uncle uses pencils down to the nub and the king does it, so you better do it too, or stories down to this kind of superhero ideas. Um, in a similar way, one doesn't really know what the royal projects do. There, there's an idea that they do good things and that's all we need to know. And I think that's an interesting way. Is, is there th that vagueness, that idea of a mystery within the heart of monarchy? Is that, an, is that a useful way of thinking about the kind of movement of philanthropy, a difference between philanthropy and welfare is that money goes into a black box and comes out and good things come out. Whereas welfare, you wanna see the entire books. So, that's one of, that's sort of the largest thing I was thinking about when I was listening to you talk. Um, other questions that come up is uh, Serhat Unaldi's book about working towards the monarchy. I, I, I thought a lot about that as well, is that when you have it, it in terms of royal inv involvement with capitalists, is there a link between monarchical uh, royal monopolies of the past and its involvement with capitalists now? What goes on when one works towards the monarchy? What goes on in these meetings? How are requests given, demanded, made explicit, made subtle? Uh, are, are they they vied for um, at, or denied, or, or are they sort of uh, solicited? Um, and the link between the idea of the monarch, especially Pumipon, and development is, I think, um, inextricable. The idea that the monarch will lead Thailand into an era of development, into an era of prosperity, but now is not that time. Now is a time of COVID, of climate disaster, of authoritarianism, of a declining economy. And I wonder about the larger sort of world historical forces that are, that are moving. Do they then move the monarchy in some other direction? Um, those are my questions. I have some, uh, I have three questions here now in the chat. Uh, would you like me to, would you like to respond for a moment or shall I go ahead and? Uh, yes, I would like to uh, respond to your very important and insightful comments. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Johnson. Uh, I think you are right to, to say that uh, we can see some parallel about the monarchy in the 1950s, 60s. Uh, in the Cold War era and, and what's going on right now, I think you are right uh, because is this the, the early period of the reign, right? Because uh, Rama the Nine's reign start uh, uh, in the mid 20th century and he struggled uh, a lot to establish himself. And it happens now with King Rama the Ten or King Wajiralongkorn uh, as well. But I think uh, the, the, the big difference is that uh, King Rama the X, uh, Wajira Longkorn, he already has uh, wealth and power with him now because of the revival of the monarchy during the reign of King Pumipon. So uh, I think this is the, the big difference, but overall, I think, yeah, there, there, there is some uh, parallels that we can see. Also, I like your point very much about the weakness of entrepreneurship and uh, the, the way the mass media uh, present uh, members of the royal family as uh, the genius in everything that they touch upon or everything that they do. Uh, they are the icons in, in pop culture, right? And it is so unreal and surreal to, to see that. And I think this is this is very important point because I think this is the way uh, the urban middle class or the, the bourgeoisie in Thailand 
want to see something that is very ideal. They, they want to, to have some model for their life, even though in reality, there is nothing close to, to, to this idealistic picture. In, in my book, I talking about the two souls of the bourgeoisie. On the one hand, they, they want to be like uh, the stereotype uh, of the bourgeois ethic, working hard and uh, be frugal and believe in their own uh, abilities. But on the other hand, there is something in their mind. Uh, when they look at royalty, they want to be part of royalty. And when they see members of the royal family uh, work hard and live a frugal life, it, uh, it made them very uh, impressed and uh, I think uh, going back to a classic theorist like Adam Smith, Adam Smith talking about uh, how ordinary people always look at uh, the upper class people and feel enchanted and feel uh, they love to see uh, royalty uh, be part of ordinary life. So I think this is, uh, this is very important point. And the last thing I want to engage with your comment is the, the royal projects. I think you are right to say that we have no idea what's going on with, with the money that go to the royal project. It is just the idea, the idea that royalty, the kings, the queens, the princess uh, engage in uh, philanthropic activities but this is, in, this is enough for the, for the middle class. They just want to believe in the idea, but they do not want to check the, the money, the do donated money. And this is very ironic because uh, the middle class in Thailand, they always promote uh, the, the concept of good governance, uh, accountability, check and balance, but they do not really use this concept and apply them to, to the royal projects. Uh, and the last point, I think you are right that uh, the role of the mass media is, is very important to, to portray uh, the, the monarchy. And right now we have the very awkward moment in, in the mass media because uh, the current monarch, he is not very popular and there is nothing to sell in, 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 in the mass media about his greatness. So now it become very awkward because compared with his uh, father, uh, there are at least something to, to say about his, his, uh, his uh, activities that help the people. So these are my uh, comments that I would like to engage with your comments. Thank you very much. I, I'd, I'd like to add that 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 black box of nobody knows what's going on in the royal projects that allows the imagination that there's genius at work because you never you never actually see it happen. Um, I'd like to read out some of the questions from the audience now. Kunita uh, Sanglim Suwan asks, uh, she's a PhD student at UCLA in sociology. She asks, she asks, how much of the changing support base from the monarchy is related to the relatively recent change in kings from Rama Gao to Rama Sip? Uh, yeah. uh, could you repeat the question again, please? Sure. How much of the changing support base from, from the monarchy is related to the change in kings? So how much of the support is actually tied to the single person of the king and not mm. to the institution? Yes, I think this is a very uh, good question. And uh, some people may believe that when the reign has changed from uh, Rama the Nine to Rama the Ten, the mass bed of the monarchy will change as well. Because uh, as I said before, uh, the current king, he is not quite popular among the people. And a lot of people believe that the middle class 
especially the middle class in Bangkok, will uh, stay away from the monarchy. They will not support the monarchy before. And on the one hand, this, uh, this, this idea is right, I think, because we see some uh, students and even some uh, businessmen who uh, join the protest and uh, ask for the monarchy reform. But in general, in the big picture, I think the mass bed supporters of the crowd is also uh, is the same. It is the, the, the middle class, well-educated people in urban cities. The very good example, in my opinion, is uh, when we look at the protesters, they are students, the new generation of the intellectual uh, people. But uh, in the academic circle, a lot of professors, teachers, lecturers in, in, in Thailand, they do not really support the, the protester. And they try to stay away to mention or discuss about the king. At best, they, are, they look indifferent to what's going on on the street. And there is no need to talk about the big capitalists, the, the Sinotai billionaires. They do not really say anything about the protester. They just stay away. And actually, uh, in the palace, they still donate money and goods to the king. So I think in general, in the big picture, uh, I think as a class, I think the, the bourgeoisie still support the king. And the only hope for change, I think, is going to be the working class and uh, the, the poor people, I think there will be the, the only hope for change, political, for, for radical change in, in Thai society. Um, okay, we have a couple other questions that have just popped in from two different windows here. Uh, Kuntiti, I'll, I'll, I'll get to your, your question here in a moment. But uh, Eric White asks, um, could you please clarify how your analysis of the deep relationship between the Thai monarchy, the bourgeoisie, and capitalist relations differs from or expands upon prior studies? Uh, and he mentions Christine Gray, uh, Popan Oyanot, uh, and Serhat Onaldi here. Uh, yeah, this is a very important question uh, because uh, those works. Uh, by Christian Gray, uh, Serhat Unaudi, Paul Pan Uyanon. Uh, those work will, will really influence me to, to write this book. And uh, I'm uh, in debt to, to those work for sure. Uh, but I think the, the only difference that my work uh, distinguish itself from those works is that uh, I try to combine three aspects about the monarchy, the economic aspect, the political aspect, and the cultural aspect. For example, when we, when we read uh, Paul Pan's work, it's really focused on the economic aspect. And for uh, so, so my, my work try to combine these this three aspects and try to update uh, more information. When my work is compared with uh, Christine Gray's work, uh, Gray's work is on the monarchy in the 1970s. It's happened a long time ago. But my work is focusing on the monarchy in the 21st century. So this is uh, the way I uh, distinguish my work from all the uh, classic works on the Thai monarchy. I'm, I'm now going to move to the question from uh, uh, Kuntiti. Uh, he asks, as I'm one of the panelists, I cannot type uh, in the Q&A box, but I have a question. My question is, 
how could we assess the monarchical institution as capitalist in a sense that so far it seems in your presentation, the monarchical institution is only accumulating and consuming capital, but it is not the greatest in, he quotes, valorizing surplus value to grow the system. Would you find the monarchy, he quotes, a lazy capitalist as Jim Glassman would characterize the Thai bourgeoisie? Uh, yes, this is very interesting question. I think when we think about monarchy, normally we think about the economic parasite. The monarchy are lazy, royalties, they are lazy. They live a luxury life. And when we think about the Thai monarchy today, on the one hand, yes, it looks like this institution is so lazy. They are uh, rent seekers. They just want to find uh, rent. Yeah, rent seeking activities is, uh, are the, the key activities of the crown. But on the other hand, I also believe that uh, we have to look at how the Crown Property Bureau really accumulate capital in the market. Uh, when we look at the major companies that the Crown Property Bureau control, such as the Siam Cement Group and the Siam Commercial Bank, these are modern companies and they are very professional. They are very active. The way they organize their own company, the way they manage their own wealth. So I think uh, the, the perception that the monarchy are, are lazy, uh, I think it is not really, uh, it is useful to some extent, but at the end of the day, we should treat the royal companies and royal wealth with, uh, we, we should look at it with the modern eyes and, and treat it like, uh, like other uh, capitalist companies in the market too. I, I think to add, I add a bit on onto there too, I, I think it, it raises questions for the idea of sacred kingship too, as, as the king is a thing set apart. Right. And then yet yeah, if there's such active capitalist um, mm -hmm. action that- Right, questions. right. I'll, I'll switch back over here. Um, so, Caverly Carey, uh, oh, please, please indicate your affiliation in, in the chat too, so I can read that out. Um, what do you think is the most significant vulnerability of the Thai monarchy? And through what mechanism might this lead to restraining or transforming the monarchy? I suppose, how might it change in the future? Yeah, I, I need to think about that question. Yeah, I need to think about that question because it looks like even though now we have a huge protest, actually we have a protest every day today, but it seems like the monarchy is still going very strong and the relationship between the monarchy and the military and the capitalist class remain very strong. So it looked like there is no weakest link, weakest point in the, in the monarchy. I think some people believe that the weakest uh, point of the monarchy today is the monarch himself. I think, yes, to some extent, we, we can say that because uh, the monarch is very important figure in, 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 the, in this institution. But uh, I don't know, I, I still, I, I need to think more about this question, yeah, because uh, normally when I, when I look at the monarchy, I try to find the strongest characteristic of, of this institution. But this question yeah, uh, involved uh, me to, to think more. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael Van, who's a historian at Sacramento State University, asks, how important was U.S. backing of anti-communism, especially during the Second Indochina War? Uh, 
to the rise of the monarchy as such a powerful institution, not to deny Thai agency in their own history, but did Cold War politics play a role here? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the role of the US is very important for the revival of the royal power because the United States saw uh, the Thai monarchy as the symbol to fight against uh, communism, especially in Southeast Asia. And the king, the queen, and the crown prince at that time always wore a military uniform and engaged in the military action to fight against the communist guerrillas in, in the jungle. And uh, the, the Thai dictators during the Cold War get, uh, got a lot of financial support from the United States. Uh, and the United States uh, did not say anything about human rights uh, abuse or uh, the demo undemocratic government in Thailand. So during the Cold War, that is the turning point because uh, the, the dictator uh, want some symbol. They want to, to use some symbol to legitimize their own power. So they use the, the monarchy and the US agree that this is a good strategy. So the US also support, support the monarchy as well. And the Thai, uh, the Thai king and queen travel around the world to the so-called uh, free world countries uh, to, to promote uh, liberal ideas. And, uh, and the US uh, play a very important role to, to support the so-called uh, royal world tour for, for the Thai royal family. Now we have a question for, uh, from Yi from uh, the School of Southeast Asia Studies at Xiamen University. And uh, they ask, could you explain why the royal family of Thailand has shown a high adaptability to capitalist developments? Is this due to the role of King Bumipon uh, himself, who is actually some, a special case personally, or is there a specific structural mechanism in Thailand that has assured this process? Her second question, or uh, their second question is, with respect to the sufficiency economy, since it emphasizes the middle path of economic development and encourages people to live in a way where they consume only what they really need, choose products carefully, how does this adapt with the idea of, for, of consumerism that's core to the notion of capitalism? Thank you very much, she says, or he says, they says. Uh, yes, these two questions are uh, very important to, to understand the, the monarchy in Thailand today. The first question is uh, how and why the Thai monarchy is able to, able to adapt itself very well to, to capitalism. Is it about King Pumipon's uh, ability or his genius to, to, to adapt himself? Uh, I think on the one hand, yes, uh, King Pumipon is, is very uh, charismatic and he knows how to use people. Uh, one of the best people in each field uh, uh, were recruited to, to the palace to help him. So it's, it is not only about the king himself, but he, 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 uh, he, has, he had many good and smart people around him. A good example is uh, the Crown Property Bureau. Bureau. Uh, King Pumipon, he had uh, a very good uh, chairman of the Crown Property Bureau. And when the financial crisis happened in Asia in uh, 1997, uh, a lot of corporations in, in Thailand uh, cannot uh, manage very well to go through this, uh, to went through this, uh, to go through this crisis. But the Crown Property Bureau can survive and came back very strong because in the Bureau, they are the best and the brightest uh, people who are so good in managing uh, the company 
of the kings. And the second question is about the sufficiency economy philosophy. This is very important royal ideology because uh, going back to the, to the example of the, the financial crisis, a lot of the middle class in Thailand, they lost uh, hope and they feel very sad that their business uh, went bankruptcy. So uh, they look at the king and they think that, wow, the king, he, he promote the middle path uh, living style, uh, not consume too much, save some money and capital for yourself, live a moderate life, uh, try to stay away from uh, the materialist, capitalist uh, lifestyle. So this is the inspiration and the ideology that very uh, inspired the, the, the Thai bourgeoisie at that time. And now, even now, they still talk about that moment, uh, the financial crisis and how the king's uh, sufficiency economy philosophy really help their life and their own companies when the crisis happened. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this at all, but uh, will major politicians defend the monarchy to the core or will they seek change? Uh, could, could you repeat it again? Will major politicians defend the monarchy to the core or do you think they will seek reform or changes? Uh, yes, this is a very good question. Uh, let's talk about Thaksin, right? Thaksin and the Pur Thai parties, politicians. I, Right now, I do not believe that Thaksin and the leaders of the Pur Thai party will, will call for the monarchy reform because it looks like Thaksin, he has a very good relation with the crowd. And going back when Thaksin was the owner of Shin Corporation, Shin Corporation is one of the major companies that donate money and goods to the crowd. On the other hand, I think the, the former future forward parties, members, uh, and also the Kao uh, Klai party, I think they, 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 they are trying right now to, 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 to call for the reform of the monarchy. They play a very important role in the parliament. They try to cut the budget of the state that go to the crowd. So I think, yes, some politicians, I'm so disappointed to see that, uh, especially the, the politician who, uh, who are the, the, the like, like Thaksin, uh, the Red Shirt supporter really, really like Thaksin, but Thaksin uh, never really say anything about how to change the monarchy. But the only hope right now, I think, is going to uh, some politicians like uh, Thanaton or uh, Pita, who, who, who play a very important role in, in the Thai parliament. Uh, and, and ask for the reform of the monarchy. To, to return, I, I'm going to take a, a little of my discussant uh, privilege here too. To return to, your que to the question about the sufficiency economy, I, I recall the commercials at the time, you know, were very much about the individual notion of sufficiency, you know, you know, something like that, like how, how sufficient are you, how sufficient as each one of us, we can be sufficient in different ways. So it turns that gaze internally and right. it makes an almost Protestant kind of ethic uh, sense to it. And I always thought that that aspect of it, not only in a way reinforced the religiosity of, of the Thai monarchy too, and, and that you had 
who because who is the most efficient person in the world and be, be the monarch and then and then we all are, are are gazing at ourselves trying to come to that point um that that link between you know when we talk about monarchy in a marxist sense we we talk about moat means production and we're talking about sort of superstructure and things like this but there is that that sort of sense of religiosity that comes in into it that i think is it, it shifting as well it, that changed during the 1990s and 2000s um, yes yes i would like to to engage with your comments i think you have you make a very good point that uh, when the crisis happened the financial crisis happened each individual entrepreneur or each individual capitalist they tend, tended to internalize all the problem that happened. And most of them blame themselves instead of criticizing and blaming the structure, right? Because the financial crisis happened because of many structural problems, right? Corruption, the way the government managed the economic policies and even the role of the, uh, the, role of the monopoly of uh, oligarchs in the market. But most of them just blame themselves and look on the television screen and see the commercials about uh, the king's philosophy of self-sufficiency uh, life. So I think this is a very good point. <laughs> and, and the uh, popular literature at the time as well was all about these <laughs> stories about, about uh, people who just ate, you know, rice porridge and fish sauce and then they made their their money like that these, these again internal focus I, I think that's 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 so interesting there's one last question here um this is again also from uh Kunita, Nita, um asks in the demands for democracy in recent protests are there is there a model democratic state that protesters are referring to i'm particularly curious considering the current time in the u.s long considered to be the strongest democracy in the world I suppose there's an irony there with the previous question about the US's role in, in Cold War politics, uh, is reckoning with its own history and understanding of democracy. Yes, uh, I think the protesters, they look up for the, the British, British model. They believe that uh, the British monarchy is a very good model to follow. Uh, this is going back to 1932, uh, we have the revolution and the revolutionaries at that time also believed that Thailand should follow the United Kingdom. We should have the monarchy that is restrained by the constitution. And I think this is the way they, they want to promote right now that yeah, Thailand should, should be like uh, uh, the United Kingdom or Japan. Uh, some protesters go as far as uh, promoting the idea of Thailand, uh, the Thai Republic, but this is just uh, the minority. I think the majority, they just, uh, they want to engage with the, the majority of Thai people today who still believe that uh, Thailand uh, still uh, needs to be uh, the kingdom instead of uh, instead of uh, republic mm -hmm. well i think uh, are we uh, is our time until uh, uh until the um is it 6 30 right now is is that is that the case um, yes we should close at 6 30 yes okay <laughs> well um do you have any, Azan, do you have any other further comments here or, or, or things you'd like to add? Uh, I would like to add that uh, I would like to thank everyone to, to participate in this event uh, because I remember when I studied in the US a few years ago, uh, I attend some Thai studies uh, seminar and it seems like uh, the speakers or some professors, both from Thailand and from abroad, did not really want to talk about the monarchy. But it seems today that it is undeniable that we have to talk about the monarchy. 
and we can talk in the academic way, right? We do not have to uh, criticize, uh, get get personal about 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 the king and, and the royal family. So uh, I just want to to thank everyone to to join the event and uh, all organizers of this event. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much as, as well. Um, with that, I suppose I'll turn it back to um, turn it back to Sarah and uh, Titi or, or or simply close things out. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll let Titi give the final word. Okay, I'll say something very quick. So thank you for a thought provoking discussion and really uh, all the replies to the challenging questions. As it is in Zoom, we have to imagine a thunderous round of applause to both Ajahn Puang Chon and Professor Johnson. And if Sarah doesn't have other more announcements, we'll be officially ending this webinar. And also the uh, advertisement for the next talks organized by ATD and CES is already in the chat box.